thank you both for uh, the informative talk. Uh, my question goes to the doctor here. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Jackson. Yeah, three years. And um, basically, I, I'd like to know how, even, you know, even though you're, you're agreeing with evolution, and, you know, <laughs> to, to, a limited, to a limited extent, you know, if you want to call it that. Even if it's that much. You know, I think we shouldn't call it microevolution. We should call it micro variation. Because when you say the word evolution, even in a small sense, uh, everyone immediately jumps to uh, you know, worms became bald eagles, which is what the theory said. And, and of course, I don't believe that. So I, I prefer to call it micro variation sure. within the species. And in fairness, I mean, there's, there's no, no evolutionist that's actually saying that worms turn into bald eagles. Oh yes, every one of them says that. That's the theory. <laughs> okay, uh, yes. We'll, yes. We'll, we'll leave it at that then. But, uh, that is the theory. How do we then take the leap that there's an intelligent creator from, from seeing evidence and saying that we don't know something, we don't know how macroevolution happened, we don't have that knowledge at this point, but we're going to inject God into the equation and say that, well, because we don't know, God did it. Well, you say that we don't know how macroevolution happened. You forgot to say we don't know if macroevolution happened. And that's the problem with assumptions. Again, I said there's nothing wrong with assumptions. But if you gloss over them and then speak the assumption as though it is a given now, we are fooling ourselves, you see, and we are not data driven any longer. We are building an assumption upon an assumption, and these things may support one another. Uh, and it may be called pars parsimony if you want to, but it's still, Simon says lift one leg, Simon says lift the other, it doesn't matter. You've still got to have some foot on the ground with these things. There's data, evidence isn't proof, but uh, you, you've got to go where the data most clearly leads, or you're being disingenuous. And you may have your favorite theory, but eventually data piles up, like finding red blood cells in a 68 million year old uh, Tyrannosaurus rex vein. I mean, the actual blood cells that were still there. That should give the evolutionary time frame some problem. And Pastor, some, after this man's done, somebody's got to call on this kid with the red hat. Because <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like some kind of windmill in the back. So, yes, but sir, yeah, I don't know if you were done with your question or not. Could you please continue if you're, if you're not? Well, I, I, I just wanted to say, along with that, then, if we're making wild assumptions based on you know, evidence. Where, where is the evidence that is leading us in the direction of an intelligent creator? The exact same evidence that might lead someone to say that there was no design, that uh, design emerged from a uh, designless process. We see the world, we see life, we see the planet, we see the universe, and it's only what's under the water of the tip of the iceberg that we disagree on how it got here again. It demands an enormous amount of faith that worms became bald eagles. It demands an enormous amount of faith that chemicals floating loose in the ocean actually, inorganic, simple chemicals, uh, generated complex organic chemicals that were then capable of wrapping themselves up in a membrane and, and then having cellular activity, becoming alive and reproducing. That takes, I think, some uh, assumptions, many, many assumptions, one, that the law of spontaneous generation, you know, is, is true, that things can spontaneously generate. Every evolutionist believes that spontaneous generation happened at least once. That's, that's undeniable. It, it, is a, it is a faith, and I have no problem with that. You see what's here, and then you think, how did it get here? You can have different stories on that. And then you, of course, have your own wagon load of assumptions that come with it. Believe in evolution if you want, but I think from what we, we've done tonight, you can't believe in it for any of the things that I refuted, and I think you're going to have to take some measure of trust to say that the endogenous retrovirus sequences indeed couldn't come about by any other means but common descent, that indeed it could never have happened over the, the period of time since life has been on Earth just by different species uh, being uh, invaded by the same viruses. Uh, uh, does, in, that, does that answer your question? That does, and, and in fairness to her, she, didn't, she also said that it could be two, sponta two separate spontaneous events or common descent. 
Well, and of you course, can tell the difference. and those would not be indicative of common descent if they were separate. Yeah. I have a question for both of you. You said we're so closely related, related to animals. Is it possible if we can like transplant animal organs to our organs? Or the other way That's a super cool story. Can I start? You go so, ahead. Um, the evolution <clears throat> of your immune system, it turns out that this really important protein that um, says, it's, it's just like a normal housekeeping protein. It says everything's normal, everything's fine. Um, if you take, uh, say, your liver and put it in meat without doing any tests, your everything fine proteins are not my everything's fine protein. So my immune cells freak out and attack your liver. So that's why you have to do special testing before you can get transplants. Well, it turns out that eggs are a really good match uh, for these everything fine um, proteins to humans. Um, the problem is pigs are also infected with endogenous retroviruses. And some of them are much younger than the ones that have infected us. So they can still make viral particles. And so what we're afraid of is that if we give someone a, a heart from a pig and all of a sudden we start getting these retroviruses produced and they infect a human and then we've got a whole other HIV crisis on our hands. So what um, some people are doing in, I believe, Australia is trying to breed pigs to get rid of all of their almost functional endogenous retroviruses and they're in a very sterile environment. So um, theoretically we could use them as a source for organs. Right. Theoretically, yes, we could. And as you know, you have to get a close tissue match even between two humans. Uh, we've been thinking about using baboon organs. They're, they're close enough. Uh, and, and people who uh, were on insulin before we genetically engineered bacteria to generate insulin uh, were using porcine insulin, insulin from pig pancreases. And uh, they would sometimes be allergic to it. They'd have to get used to it. Their system would have to adjust. And then uh, after they switched to the new uh, human insulin that was being cranked out by these genetically engineered bacteria, some of the people uh, showed an allergic reaction because they'd accommodated to, the, to the, the pig insulin. So the immune system is a funny thing, but it is watching out for you. Uh, and and there, there are dreams of, uh, of, of course, cloning your heart cells and keeping a spare in case you need it. People are talking more openly about that than exotransplants, interspecies transplants. But, but that, I think, is still being discussed. Uh, for Adam, a question for you. You know how like, you said that species can make those, like, their own species? What if you get a, a human and an ape or something from that species? What would happen? I have no idea. Like, I've heard creepy stories about like, <laughs> trying that in, like, Soviet Russia, but I don't know anything above like, rumors. I, th I think that's one of those ethical things that that's not going to be a line that's crossed. <laughs> I think we can agree on that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we agree. Humans and apes shouldn't have that. <laughs> <laughs>